Diana, and together with Milena, we will be in charge of the ceremonial. This event was organized by the Internationalization at Home Department of the International Cooperation Office at Twain, in partnership with Paraná Speaks English. So the aim is to share and discuss aspects related to language teaching and learning, especially the ones related to bilingualism, multilingualism, translanguaging, and the psychology of language learning. To talk about these themes, we have two very special guests. Professor Maria Dantas Whitney from Western Oregon University and Professor Plinio Marco Gittoni from Unicentro. Maria and Plinio, it is a pleasure to receive you virtually at Twain. Thank you very much for taking part in this event and for sharing your knowledge and experience with us. So, to welcome our speakers, we invite Professor Marcio Pascual Cassandri, the head of the International Cooperation Office. Okay, thank you, Luciana. Good evening, everyone. I welcome our speakers, Professor Maria and Professor Plinio. Uh, we are very happy to have you here tonight. And um, today, the State University of Maringá receives another moment of knowledge exchange promoted by our uh, internationalization at home sector of our international office. And I have to thank you, Luciana, Milena, Isabelle, for all the effort to expand our network and promote more knowledge for our academic community. And Professor Maria, I don't know uh, if you know this information, but Wayne is a very young lady. We are only 50 years old last year, and we have more than, than 69 undergraduate courses, 56 masters and 30 doctorate courses, adding more than 20 thousand students from six different different uh, cities in addition to the headquarters of this campus we are very proud to be part of this moment uh, it's not an easy moment uh, when we think about the covid but uh it's so promoter of so many good meetings like this one um and i would like to invite professor maria to visit us in the future here in maringa and another good information is that Maringá was considered uh, this year, I think, yes, uh, uh, by a well-known mag magazine as the best city to live in Brazil. So, uh, uh, Professor Plinio is from a, a, almost a sister uh, uh, of Wayne. Uh, Unicentro is a, a, a university very close to us and we like to exchange also with our sisters uh, and at least the internalization uh, internationalization of our university takes another step tonight offering such a brilliant discussion to our community thank you all enjoy this event thank you thank you marcio we would also like to welcome all the participants. They are from varied fields of knowledge and from different parts of Brazil, and now we know from different parts of the world as well. So that are also English language teachers and English language learners from Paraná Speaks English, the Language Institute of our university, and many other contexts. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Luciana, would you like? I was just yeah. <laughs> okay. Sorry for that. So no our problem. first speaker is Professor Maria Dantas Whitney. She will talk about bilingualism, multilingualism, and translanguaging in, in educational contexts. Before she starts her talk, Milena will read her bio data. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Dr. Maria Dantas Whitney is a professor of ESOL and bilingual education at Western Oregon University where she also coordinates the Bilingual Teacher Scholars Program. She has a bachelor's degree in letters from University Santa Ursula, Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, a master's degree in teaching English as a second language from Northern Arizona University, and a PhD in education from Oregon State University. Dr. Dantas Whitney has been a Fulbright Scholar in Mexico and Panama and has had consultancies for ELT educators in Brazil, Costa Rica, Peru, the Dominican Republic and Cyprus. She has directed several grant projects providing professional development opportunities for K-12 teachers on how to best meet the needs of emergent bilingual learners. 
Dr. Dentas Whitney. Uh, Whitney has served as president of Oregon TESOL and Oregon Association of Teacher Educators. She is a recipient of the American Educational Research Association Outstanding Dissertation Award in Second Language Research and the TESOL College Board Award for Teacher as Classroom Researcher. Her research focuses on issues of identity and agency related to multi uh, multilingualism, bilingualism, school and schooling, as well as the development of critical cultural consciousness and critical pedagogy, pedagogical approaches in teacher education. So thank you again for being here, Maria, with us this evening. And so she will now start her talk and we'll have some time for a chat with her and Professor Plinio in the end. So Maria, it's with you now. Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction. Thank you for the invitation as well. It's really an honor to be here and um, to talk to my fellow Brazilians and also um, others from other countries too, which is really uh, amazing. And I really look forward to the exchange of ideas with Plinio as well and with all of you. Um, as, uh, as Milena said, I'm originally from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. And so I will have to visit Maringá and really compare to see if it is really the number one city in Brazil to, to live. I, 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 I'm still a little skeptical. I'm going to have to come visit and make sure that that's really true. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and um, share my screen so we can start the presentation. So can everybody see it? Yes. yes. All right, mm -hmm. great. So um, as, um, as Luciana mentioned, I'm gonna be talking about uh, bilingualism and multilingualism and translanguaging and educational contexts. And as, as you, um, as, as has been said, I am um, a teacher educator, right? I work with um, teachers and both pre-service and in-service uh, who are, uh, wanting to become um, either English as a second language teachers or bilingual education teachers, right? But I do realize that today in the audience, we also have uh, quite a few language learners too. So I'm going to be talking I'm going to be talking about find it, uh, foundational principles and also engagement in language learning. And um, as I talk about these things, I'm going to talk a lot about uh, different classroom practices and um, and I would like for you to think about your own perspectives either as a teacher or as a future teacher or as a language learner as well. I think that um, the kinds of things that I'm going to be talking about related to the foundational principles as well as uh, issues related to context, to identities, to uh, language awareness. I think that um, all these topics would be applicable whether you are considering these um, perspectives from the view of, of teaching or from the view of learning, all right? So let's start by talking a little bit about views of bilingualism. We used to think that uh, bilinguals were like two monolinguals in one, right? This idea that, um, you know, we would um, learn one language in its entirety and then add another language that would be just as uh, balanced and, as, and, and also separate, right? Um, the, the metaphor that we have for that, this idea of additive bilingualism is of this bicycle, right? With two completely balanced and separate uh, wheels. But we know that that's not true um, in, anymore, right? We, these days we know that um, bilinguals acquire and use their languages for different purposes in different domains of life with different people. So different aspects of life will require different languages, right? And Garcia talks about this as dynamic bilingualism, 
right? And and uh, the the image that comes to mind is this image of uh, an all-terrain vehicle, right? You use the different um, the different wheels of the vehicle for different purposes and uh, for different contexts, right? And this really reflects the, a view of language as a social process, right? Language as a unified repertoire that has evolving and negotiating features, right? That are ve that's very dynamic and always changing as opposed to this very static um, concept. So let's talk a little bit about translanguaging too. Translanguaging is uh, a concept that's becoming more and more uh, studied and um, uh, very prevalent in the literature of bilingualism uh, right now. And translanguaging really offers a different view of bilingualism and multilingualism. Uh, it offers this view that languages are not separated in the mind of a bilingual person. The bilingual mind is really seen as this holistic sim uh, system that contains diverse linguistic resources that we then use and employ for different communicative purposes, right? And I'm sure, you know, all of you here are at least bilingual, right? Uh, and I'm sure many of you are multilingual. And you can probably relate to this, right? The idea that perhaps for different areas of your life, uh, one language will become uh, more prevalent than other languages. And I can give you the example of myself, right? I am uh, originally from Brazil. My native language is Portuguese. I've been living here in the US for over 30 years. Um, but there are certain things in my life that I that I still have to do in, in Portuguese because it seems very artificial and um, not very natural for me to do it in in English. So, for example, whenever I have to do math, I do it in Portuguese. I have to revert back to Portuguese because I cannot do math in English, right? Um, but if, I, if I'm giving a professional presentation, I've been teaching in English for so long, it's much easier for me to do it in English. So again, this idea of having this linguistic repertoire that we utilize for different purposes in different contexts in different areas of our lives, right? And the idea of translanguaging is also very transformative and empowerment empowering for uh, teachers and students right because it really capitalizes on assets of our learners right so instead of thinking about myself for example having to do math in Portuguese sometimes uh, you know perhaps an English teacher would would think of that as a weakness right oh you don't know your English is not good enough you cannot do math in English well this translanguaging view uh, looks at our assets, our, at our strengths, and say, wow, how wonderful that you are able to go back and forth to use your complete uh, linguistic repertoire to move from one language to another and really, um, and really um, capitalize on all of your linguistic resources in order to accomplish your communicative needs of everyday life, right? So translanguaging really has these different um, facets, right? It's, it has the theoretical stance, but it also um, touches upon ideology and it has a lot of pedagogical implications for the classroom as well, right? So as a theory, as a theory of bilingualism, <clears throat> it, uh, it talks about, it posits uh, this enactment of a coherent linguistic repertoire, right? So we don't, we don't speak about, you know, a bilingual person having two separate languages or a trilingual person having three separate languages. Instead, we talk about a holistic 
uh, linguistic repertoire that can be manifested uh, differently according to the different uh, situations that we are in our lives, right? So it's an integrated system that includes fluid and dynamic future features of our diverse language varieties, right? <clears throat> and it's holistic right it's one system as opposed to these separate linguistic systems that we have it's also an ideological position because it it presents this critique of racial and linguistic hierarchies right for political and cultural transformation so often we have to be uh, very cognizant of these linguistic hierarchies that happen um, all over the world right and i'm sure it happens in brazil too so often english is positioned as a superior language uh, to other languages right when we when we talk about uh, international communication, when we talk about, um, even in the English classroom, I think very often there is this, um, there's this tendency of uh, being kind of purist and uh, prohibiting uh, students from speaking uh, their native languages when they are learning an additional language, right? And so the translanguaging theory kind of pushes against that and said and says well all of uh, all of the linguistic repertoires of our students are important and we should utilize them as resources for them to learn other languages right and that's where the pedagogical uh practice comes in the idea of using translanguaging as a pedagogical practice too right <clears throat> using the la learners language practices as resources for them to learn to think to imagine and develop their their performances <clears throat> So let's talk a little bit about this idea of using translanguaging as a pedagogical practice. So you probably have heard the, the, uh, the expression code switching before, right? This idea, code switching means alternating between codes, right? Alternating between languages, right? Some people, uh, uh, scholars in the area of translanguaging right now, they crit critique this notion of uh, code switching because first of all, it um, implies this very uh, separated linguistic system, right? W whenever you talk about switching from one code to another, you really buy in by implication, you are uh, talking about two separate systems that, that the person has to go from one to another, right? So that can be a little problematic uh, when we adopt this idea of a translanguaging perspective where we are saying that a linguistic repertoire is a holistic repertoire that each of us have in our minds, right? And also, many people say that code switching is a concept that's often associated with a deficit perspective, right? And, and we hear that quite often, especially <clears throat> in classrooms here in the United States, for example, with uh, students who are immigrant learners who perhaps grow, grow up in homes where <clears throat> other languages are spoken other than English. For example, here in Oregon, we have a uh, large population of students who speak Spanish in the home and then they come to school and they start learning English right and very often when students start um, you know using both Spanish and English um, to communicate um, there is this kind of a deficit perspective that some people will associate with this idea of uh, mixing languages as not knowing either language when really the opposite is true right what's happening is the students are utilizing all aspects of their linguistic resources to communicate so instead of thinking about um this idea of uh, utilizing different languages to communicate 
as a deficit, we should really think about as a strength, right? As an asset. So translanguaging reflects this asset perspective, thinking, wow, how wonderful that you have these two languages to, to rely on. Let's build on that and let's utilize one language to learn the other, right? <clears throat> So here's some examples of, and these are just examples, right, of uh, translanguaging practices that could be, could happen in a bilingual classroom, right? The teacher labels objects in the classroom in English and in Portuguese, right? So you're utilizing those, um, the, the bilingualism of your students to help them learn either English or Portuguese or both, right? <clears throat> For homework, students interview their parents in Portuguese about their favorite foods, and then they write a short summary in English. So again, you are utilizing your primary language, and then you're transferring that information into the, your second language, right, into English in this case. Uh, here's another example. During a discussion about hobbies, the class explores vocabulary words that are similar in Portuguese and in English, right? So exploration of cognates, that's a big, big um, area of, um, of uh, research and study and also pedagogical practice in translanguaging classrooms. So, so then the teacher will explore with the students words like theater and teatro, right? Sport and sport, music and musica, etc. right? Those words that sound the same in two languages, the cognates. Here's another example. During a research project, students search information on websites in Portuguese and in English, and then they prepare a short oral presentation in English. <clears throat> so again, um, translanguaging, is a lot more than just switching from one language to another. It's utilizing your skills, your abilities in one language in order to communicate and in order to learn uh, the other language as well, right? So let's talk a little bit about um, learning a language from a social cultural perspective, because that's very connected to this idea of uh, utilizing translanguaging in uh, our, for teaching and learning as well. So we know that language in and of itself doesn't carry meaning, right? Meaning is enacted through socialization, right? Through social processes, right? So really it is a lot more accurate for us to talk about language socialization than language acquisition, really, right? We, we know that we don't learn, um, knowledge is not uh, acquired simply by a teacher kind of pouring information into a student's mind, right? We learn by doing, by interacting, by socializing, right? And so learners are creators of their own knowledge, right? They learn by creating new meanings based on their prior experiences, their skills, their beliefs, and interacting with others as well. So in order for us to facilitate language learning, we need to create classroom activities that help our students reshape their existing knowledge in light of new course content, right? So we start out with their prior experiences, with their prior knowledge, and we help them make that hook right? Make connections between what they already know and the new information, the new language that we are presenting. And, and so as teachers, we are simply that, those facilitators of learning as opposed to the, the person that will just give knowledge to the students, right? Um, and that's really important to think about. So, we're gonna be talking about engagement in language learning. And in particular, I'd like to talk about these two concepts, 
authenticity, and language awareness, okay? And in talking about authenticity, I'm gonna be talking about this idea of context and the idea of identity. And in talking about language awareness, I'd like to talk about instructional conversations and also the development of metacognition and critical thinking. So again, I know that um, several people here are not teachers and are not planning to become teachers, but perhaps from the perspective of a language learner, you can make connections with these concepts as well, okay? So let's start with authenticity, okay? So language is a resource, as we have talked about, to enact social life, right? Language is not just a collection of technical skills, an object of analysis. I'm sure you have all had um, experiences in classrooms learning a second language where all you did was to perhaps memorize vocabulary words or perhaps do verb conjugations and lots of repetition and that kind of thing, right? That's like the traditional way of learning another language. And we know that that doesn't work, right? What, what language really is, is a way for us to socialize. It's a way for us to interact, right? It's a complex, dynamic, and situated process. It does not simply involve imitation or reproduction. So we need to create authentic le le learning experiences in the classroom that reflect the social and cultural context of our learners, right? Uh, remember what we talked about, we, we need to help them access their experiences, their prior knowledge in order to continue to learn, in order to make those connections between their prior knowledge with the new content that's being uh, presented in the classroom. Also, uh, we have some scholars out of Arizona, Gonzalez, Moll, and Amante, who talk about this idea of funds of knowledge. And that's a really important idea for us to consider too. Uh, funds of knowledge means all the different resources from families, from homes, from our communities that students bring with them to the classroom that we can utilize as sources of learning in the classroom, right? So perhaps, um, you know, students, maybe they have uh, a parent who is a really good car mechanic and they know a lot about cars and they know a lot about how to fix cars. Why not utilize that knowledge that certain students have to um, help them make connections and to build upon that into the classroom and to learn the English language based on those experiences of utilizing students' funds of knowledge. Um, and then, of course, really important, applying learning within the local culture, right? Building relationships with the community and having um, having a unified um, classroom like, like a lot of you do in Brazil, you know, with all uh, Brazilian learners uh, can, can be a really wonderful resource as well because so many of your students will share aspects of their culture, of their community that they can bring on to, uh, to the classroom, to the English classroom as resources to learn, uh, to learn the language. So I'd, I'd like to give you an example of a um, classroom that I worked with in Mexico. So this is from my time when I was working in Mexico. And these were children in third grade. And, um, and as you can see here, the textbook that they were using was very limited. They were, you know, this was a unit on uh, occupations, right? So the students were learning how to say engineer and doctor and teacher and secretary, farmer, etc. And really, as you can see, the, ex the, the exercise in the book was quite mechanical, right? Because pretty much 
all the students had to do was to choose a word from the word bank and then um, look at the pictures and decide which word would go where. And that was it, right? But if you take a look at these pictures, you can see that these pictures don't really reflect the Mexican um, context where these students were. These students were in the town of Oaxaca in southern Mexico, um, which has a very rich um, cultural uh, communities, uh, lots of indigenous communities live and work there. And so, for example, a farmer in the state of Oaxaca doesn't look like that. We're talking about small family farms, right? An artist doesn't look like that either. You know, there are lots of artists there, but uh, these are people who are working with small wooden sculptures and paintings and so on. So for sure, the book that, that was being used in the classroom didn't reflect the students' realities and didn't, re and the exercises were very mechanical and didn't lend themselves to rich communicative uh, interactions, right? So what did the teachers decide to do? These were teachers that I was working with. They still, they did the exercises in the book, but then they expanded those activities, right? And one of the activities that they had the students do was to, to, to create short posters talking about their future aspirations, right? What they wanted to do in the future. Nothing too, too revolutionary, right? But this activity, as you, we can see, allowed the students to draw from their funds of knowledge, from their context, from their culture, and start talking about what those, um, those, um, their aspirations, those occupations would mean for them in the future. And so on the front part of the poster, they, the students needed to say what they wanted to be when they grew up. And then in the back, they asked, what don't you want to be and why? Right now, these kids were just starting to learn English. This was their very first year of English, and of course, they didn't have the the vocabulary and the and the skills to really talk about why. Right. So, what did the teachers do? They used some translanguaging practices here. They said, "Okay, you need to write." the first sentence in English, but then you can write the rest in, in, in Spanish in order to explain why, right? So this student, for example, I want to be a, a fireman, and um, why, right? Why do you want to? Por qué apaga el fuego? Y gana mucho dinero, this guy said. And then on the other side, he, he said, I don't want to be a teacher. So they are using the English language that they have, which was the objective and the goal of the lesson, but they are expanding that with their Spanish in order to really fully understand uh, and, um, and really um, explore more deeply the content of the lesson and i don't know if you can read what what uh what this kid said about why they don't want to be a teacher but i will read it to you it says porque hacen huelga and huelga in spanish means strike uh in portuguese it would be grevy uh, because the teachers uh go on strike they they are always um in gravy, right? And this was a very, very specific um, aspect of being a teacher in the state of Oaxaca in Mexico, because the teachers in Mexico in this state are, are like activists. They are always going on strike and they're always doing, you know, demonstrations on the streets and so on. So for these students, they were able to make that connection between being a teacher and going on strike, which was a very contextual connection that they made. And if these, if these English teachers 
hadn't uh, allowed them to use their their Spanish language as a resource to more fully um, explore the occupation of being a teacher, they wouldn't have been able to express themselves in that way. They would have just stayed with, oh, okay, a teacher is somebody who looks like this. And that was it, right? And um, so this was a, a much richer way of exploring uh, the language and the concepts. Okay, let's talk about identities, right? Because this is really important in language learning too. It is through language that a person negotiates a sense of self within and across different sites and different points of time. And language learning is, all, is something that um, is about acquiring new identities, right? Where, and, but you have to still be able to preserve and respect your previous identity in order to successfully acquire a new one, right? As you are expanding your identity into speaking a new language, right? And really optimal learning occurs with maximum cognitive engagement and maximum identity investment, right? This idea of identity investment is a really important concept, which is connected to the concept of motivation, right? Um, a lot of people talk about motivation in learning really occurs when you and I is in right when the learning um will will um make your identity positive right when your identity is um um reflected in a positive way during that learning so here's an example of a classroom in the united states actually where the teacher decided to create um a language, not a language, but a, a family journal. Of course, they were learning Spanish, right, in the United States. This was bi a bilingual classroom. And so what she did was she had this, this was a second grade classroom, and she had a, a, a stuffed animal, the little toucan that was called Tomas, and a notebook that would go from home to home each evening. And so each evening, the children, the child who brought the journal home would play with the stuffed animal, with the little bird, Tomas, and then would write down together with the family sometimes what they did together, right? So you can see here that in one of the pages, they they had a meal together. In another one, they were playing the you know the the pool game and then you know the next day that journal would go to a different home and then the next day they would go to a different home so it was a way for the children to really highlight their identities right in a very positive light all right let's talk about this concept of language awareness Right? And language awareness means this conscious understanding of how language works and uh, how people learn and how people use language. So in for the classroom, what this means is we need to create activities that raise consciousness, right? That promote noticing, right? By selectively uh, focusing on aspects of language using context. So having students build theory of how language works, reflect on their current language abilities and also make plans for future language development. And one way to do that is through what we call instructional conversations, right? Instructional conversations is pretty much the teacher guiding the students, having a dialogue with the students with, a, with the purpose of teaching right so it's very different from just a lecture just the teacher talking it's the teacher giving a lecture but in a in a way that it's a give and take right the teacher listens carefully makes guesses about intended meaning that the students um uh 
uh, express they, the teacher adjusts responses and assists the students when they need some help right and in the process the teacher engages in what we call languaging or grammaring right this dynamic process of teaching grammar but going through that thinking process of noticing, hypothesis, testing, and analysis together with the students, right? And this, of course, raises, raises metacognition, right? And such a conversation enables the teacher to contextualize teaching, to fit the learner's experiences and needs and make those connections for the students, right? So here's an example of a classroom in the United States as well. And here's a teacher who is teaching about different kinds of animals that live in the ocean. And they are building this graphic organizer here together through several days, right? This wasn't just in one day. But the teacher, you know, has different pictures. And little by little, together with the students, they decide where they're going to place the different pictures according to the categories in the graphic organizer. And again, later on, then the students do the same thing uh, by themselves in groups. They kind of teach each other. So there is that um, process of peer teaching as well, all through those instructional conversations. Um, Metacognitive, metacognition and critical thinking, right? Also really important uh, for raising language awareness. Uh, so students analyze their own learning and then they become aware of their own knowledge construction process and they start developing st strategies to improve their own learning, right? So they, they develop strategies for goal setting, for monitoring their learning, for evaluating their learning. And then they, we encourage them to use the same patterns of thinking and reasoning that experts use, right? It's really a vehicle for lifelong learning because as teachers, we cannot teach all of the English language that students will ever need right in our classroom in our uh, limited time that we have with our students so what we need to do is to help our students learn on their own right so this type of um of process of developing metacognition developing uh, developing critical thinking helps students build autonomy so that they develop these habits of mind and here are some examples of how you know teachers can do that um, so here's an example of a teacher this is, this was a unit uh, uh, on birds and they had several specimens of different birds and they are looking at books and they are comparing okay so they're trying to to identify what kind of toucan that is. So let's look at the beak. Is that the same as this one in the on the book? Let's try to compare and contrast. Let's try to identify, right? So this is a process of uh, learning to learn, right? Again, using graphic organizers and building graphic organizers together with students is, a, is also a wonderful way to develop critical thinking, to develop metacognition. This was um, a unit on animals, again, animals that live in the water. So they were comparing and contrast, contrasting fish and whales, you know, what's different between them and what's common right what's the same so again to, uh, having that instructional conversation little by little building uh, that um, that graphic organizer together with the students help them not just learn that vocabulary that they have but also help them develop that metacognition about oh okay so this is how you're comparing this is how you're contrasting and uh, there, a lot of interaction is happening too so they're also learning how to interact right so and this other activity here that we have on the right is what we call a carousel brainstorming 
And usually this happens in the beginning of a unit. It's a really good activity for prediction, for anticipating uh, what's going to come, and also for activating that prior knowledge that students may already have about the topic of a lesson, right? So what you do is you create all these posters with different pictures that are related to the topic of your unit, and you have your students in pairs or perhaps a small group maybe three go through each one of the posters and put down ideas on the paper some of the ideas may be just observations that they make about the picture some of the ideas may be maybe questions that they ask themselves about the picture things that they want to know and then of course that those posters stay on the wall during the whole unit and the teacher can always refer back to them during the unit. Oh, we can answer this question now. This, you know, some some of you asked this question earlier, like, you know, three days ago. Now we have the information, let's answer them, right? So it's very dynamic and it's also a way for students to make those knowledge connections uh, to prior learning, right? Okay, we're coming to the end of our um, session here. And I'd like to kind of, um, close by talking about this idea of cross-languaging, cross-language connections, right? Because really, um, when we talk about using translanguaging in a classroom in a, you know, for, to, to foster bilingualism, to foster um, multilingualism, we need to think about doing it in a very intentional, way in a way that's planned as opposed to oh let's just use you know in in your case english and portuguese whenever that comes up it's really important for us as teachers to design instructional units and assessments that purposefully and strategically mobilize all of our students' linguistic repertoires, right? And one way of doing that is by encouraging instructional moments in the classroom, like uh, planning those moments where we encourage students to make these cross-language connections, right? When the teachers will help students bridge their knowledge and their skills in one language and apply those that knowledge and those skills to the other language, right? And this helps students strengthen their bilingual identities. It helps their social emotional development because they feel like, oh yes, I already know a lot. You know, this word in Portuguese is so similar to English as opposed to feeling like, oh, I don't know any English and I'm gonna have to start from zero. No, you're not starting from zero. You already know so much and look and see how this connects, right? And it's really a, a tool for social justice too, as we think about um, our uh, students in the classroom who may be in more vulnerable positions and more marginalized positions as well. So here are some examples. Um, you know, using cognates, for example, and having the students very um, strategically think about words that sound the same and that look the same in one language and another. You can do that with grammar points as well. So, for example, here we have a teacher um, helping students think about word order in Spanish and in English. Oh, how interesting in Spanish have the, the the noun before the the adjective right but in english it's just the opposite the adjective comes before the noun right um also think about word parts right so uh the past tense here in english it's ed and in spanish is a bond right so there's so many ways of having students and again this builds metacognition as well having students very strategically and very um, intentionally build these connections between their their different languages within their linguistic repertoire 
So we, I knew that we weren't gonna have time for this, but I have um, a video that I that I'm gonna put in the chat the the link to for you to watch because the this video uh, is a video that shows concrete examples in 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 different classrooms where teachers are actually doing that are making these cross language connections in the classroom and. Um, when you do watch this video, I would like to encourage you to think about how these different teachers in the video um, infuse all these different concepts that we talked about today. Authenticity, highlighting context and identities, and then also language awareness, um, infusing this idea of uh, instructional conversations and metacognition as well. Okay? So thank you. And I look forward to the discussion and also to Pliny's presentation. Bye-bye.